My friends, I know it's been a while since my last Ukraine war video, so I owe you a long and girthy update. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Here on the 29th of October from Reuters, Russia takes two Ukrainian towns as it advances at fastest pace in a year. The same day the Kiev Independent reported, Ukraine facing grim situation in Donetsk Oblast. That was the situation in the South Donetsk Front on September 1st. You can see that the strategic city of Pokrovsk is located at the top of the screen. And this is the situation now, two months later. As you can see, the front line and all Ukrainian positions simply melted down. <laughs> Long story short, our beloved Ukrainskaya Armia is facing a complete rout, a debacle. Those are all the settlements that have been swooped by the horde in the past few weeks. Turns out, in the end, the only thing that Russia is running out of are flags. Hurra! And the Russians are not done. Now they're pouring all available reserves right into the breach. In this campaign, the Russian army successfully unblocked Donetsk city. Since now, all Ukrainian artillery batteries are out of range of the separatist capital. It's a real nightmare scenario for Ukraine, but how could it be otherwise? Ukraine only got untrained conscripts sitting in half-assed trenches. Don't believe me? Check this out. On the 8th of September, The Economist reported, Yuri, a soldier attached to the 59th Brigade based near Ukrainsk, says Ukrainian losses have been significant. A reinforcement of inexperienced infantrymen sent from Ukraine's 71st Brigade were wiped out. He said over three days, 100 became zero. Some ran, some fell. We have more and more footage of Ukrainian units, mostly composed of conscripts, just abandoning their combat positions and fleeing from the onslaught. A unit is running from the battlefield! But really, who can blame them in such conditions? Yuri ended by saying, We have been fighting with our last guard and have thrown our logistics guys into the trenches. Now if you think this is crazy and immoral, the US Army did exactly the same thing during World War II. And let me tell you, it was inefficient and a pure waste of manpower. If you're interested, I did an entire video about it. I titled it, Why Being a US Infantryman During World War II Was Hell. The link is in the description. Yeah, the situation in the South Donetsk area is really worrisome for Ukraine. They're literally getting rammed by entire armored columns and they don't have anything to stop them. No reserves, no fortifications, no minefields, nothing. At this rate, within a couple weeks, the Russian armed forces could very well capture all this ground between Pokrovsk and Velika Novosilka, 30 kilometers long by 30 kilometers wide. The big question is, where is the Russian army going to stop? No! In regards to that, the next video will be about the potential effects on Ukraine of the election of President Trump. Welcome to History Legends and hear the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. For those wondering where I was, essentially I went to Japan. If you're interested, I can think of a special episode about my experience in the land of the rising sun. Then I worked on this video and this one. But now it's time to go back to the Ukraine war because, let me tell you, a lot of things have happened. Let's start with the Pokrovskoye Napravlenie, the Pokrovsk direction. On the map, you can see the city of Pokrovsk at the top. During the late summer, the Ukrainian command sent a lot of reinforcements there to hold the line and stop the Russian offensive right in its tracks. With that being said, the most important objective for Ukraine was to protect the crown jewels, aka the twin cities of Slavyansk and Kramatorsk in North Donetsk. For the Ukrainian command, as long as they prevented the Russians from pushing into this direction, it was okay. In turn, the Russian army doubled down. They rammed all their available reserves right into the soft belly of the Ukrainian front. The objective was to outflank the bulk of Ukrainian resistance from the western side. And this led to heavy fighting taking place around the town of Selidove. If it fell, the Russians would be once again within reach of Pokrovsk. Meanwhile, another worry for the Ukrainian command was this big cauldron west of Nevelsky that was at risk of being cut off. 
To prevent a disaster, Ukraine forces would have to hold their positions around Ukrainsk and pull out their troops from the pocket in a retrograde coordinated maneuver. This double mission of protecting the flanks and withdrawing was assigned to the 59th Motorized Brigade. Here you can see some of their units repulse a Russian armored assault, but for how long this battered formation would still be able to hold. From the Russian perspective, the army staff knew that they had to benefit from Ukraine's lack of artillery and its shortage of manpower. So their goal was to pour everything they had right into the breach and continuously charge in the open to prevent Ukrainian army units to catch a break and rebuild a new line of defense. The Russian command also knew that they had to put the Shvea punkt of their offensive on Ukrainian units that suffered from weak mechanization and low quality of personnel. September 2024 in the first days of September, the Russians tried to storm Selidove. They did so with small infiltration teams that would stealthily approach enemy positions, usually teams of three to four men at a time. For the south, the first Russian assault detachment started this operation to encircle the Ukrainian soldiers stuck in this bulge. The Ukrainians immediately responded and counterattacked, first by suppressing and pinning down enemy spearheads with 82mm mortar fire or they tried to reclaim the lost ground immediately, like in this footage. We see a Ukrainian BMP-2 from the 59th Motorized Brigade, disembarking a squad of 8 men while providing them with suppressive fire. These operations are risky and have to be very quick because Ukraine cannot afford to lose more armored vehicles. By the 6th of September, the Russians achieved a girthy 4km penetration between the towns of Ukrainsk and Hirnik. If we zoom in, it's like a dagger. Half of Lizivka was already under Russian control, a mission completed by soldiers of the 114th Vostok Brigade of the DPR. Meanwhile, forward elements of the Russian army had already gotten a foothold inside Ukrainsk. But just a tip though, was others tickled the outskirts of Hirnik. Despite this Russian attack, most Ukrainian reinforcements were however dispatched towards Zelidove in order to protect the strategic city of Pokrovsk. Here from Forbes, Ukrainian reinforcements are counterattacking outside Pokrovsk. That's when elements of three Ukrainian brigades showed up on the battlefield, like the 15th Karadag, 12th Azov, and 93rd Mechanized Brigades, all very capable formations. Although there was much hype about this counteroffensive, in my opinion, their mission was to push just enough to create some space and breathing room around Selidove. With that being said, their effect was felt immediately. For example, here we see a javelin of the 2nd Battalion of the Karadag Brigade that managed to destroy a Russian T-72B3 tank. It's funny, javelins used to be this Wunderwaffe, yet they're a rare sight these days on the battlefield. Let me know in the comment section if you know why. There are also units of the Ukrainian 5th Tank Brigade, equipped with, wait for it, Leopard 1A5 tanks. I guess when the Ukrainians resort to modernized tanks from the 1960s, then it's brilliant, so smart, the smartest of moves. But when the Russians do it, they're just stupid mujiks. So the Russians were trying to increase the pressure on Selidove. But to get the foothold inside the town, they had to cross over this railway line, specifically through this underpass going under the railway line. Let's just say the first few attempts didn't end well. In the video, we see a Russian BTR-82A with about nine riflemen that disembarked and were all grouped up together. That's when, all of a sudden, a Ukrainian tank hit the bullseye. Seconds later, a Ukrainian BTR charged towards the underpass and went to punish the enemy's brave but futile attempt. The BTR fired frantically at every building in that sector before falling back to base. The Russian command said, Beliat! and just called for an aviaudar, an airstrike on this bridge. There was a reason to be salty because the battle for Selidove would last for another two months. Fun historical fact, apparently the town of Selidove was founded by Moldovan and Valachian settlers around 1770. This stays between us, let's not tell Maya Sandu about it. The 6th of September also marked the final capture of Krasnorivka by Russian armed forces. Here you can see how the flag of the Russian Federation was placed on the building at the northwestern edge of the town almost four and a half months after the start of the battle. It's not a surprise that by the next day, Ukrainians quickly started withdrawing from the pocket that is eight kilometers wide and 11 kilometers long. Like I told you in the introduction, it was the 59th Brigade that was holding that part of the front, but at great cost. 
the Ukrainian command was sending one company of conscripts after another in order to stem the flow of Russian forces and gain enough time to pull out all the elite formations first. Further north, by the 8th of September, Ruske Pehatinsi, Russian infantrymen, planted a flag at the center of Rodivka after a one-kilometer push. We know of these Russian gains because of the following footage. We see a Ukrainian BTR-80 that tried to counterattack, which is then quickly hit by an RPG and forced to stop. As they're facing, small arms fire, the soldiers inside slowly make their way out. The situation is tense, there are explosions all around. A couple seconds later, the BTR gets warned by FPV drones, causing uh, a number of casualties. By the 10th of September, the Ukrainian command faced a real DP, or double problem. Both Selidovy and Ukrainsk were being targeted. Russian spearheads everywhere. 1.6 km push here, 1.6 km behind the village of Marinivka, a 3.6 km charge from Memrik, right in between Selidove and Ukrainsk, coupled with an expanding Russian foothold south of Ukrainsk. At that moment, the Russian army was progressing along four main axes. They were all going westwards. Z for Zapad. We actually have footage of yet another Ukrainian counterattack against this Russian grouping next to Marinivka. Here we see a Ukrainian tank push across open field while being covered by artillery shells releasing a smoke screen. The tank fires the first time at about 75 meters, double tapped just to make sure, and then moved to the left and fired his third and fourth rounds before closing in the distance. Six shots at 50 meters, seven shots right at point blank. After that, a couple more obscuration rounds were fired to cover the retreat of the tank. Another interesting thing, the logo on the top right is the one of the 68th Jäger Brigade. And if we look at the deployment map, the 68th Jäger Brigade is indeed positioned near Marinivka. As a reminder, these hit-and-run fire missions are a direct response to Ukraine's shortage of manpower. Because normally after the tank obliterated the Russian defenders, this should be combined with an assault by infantry units to regain all these lost trenches. Marinivka was now in a gray zone. It was getting pummeled by Russian artillery like no tomorrow all the while being harassed by FPV drone strikes. In the south, by the 11th of September, the Ukrainian army witnessed a 2km withdrawal from the Nevelsky pocket. Two days later, another wave of Russian infiltration groups approached Selidove from the east. We know this because of all the footage of Ukrainian drones dropping grenades on these units. With that being said, these Russian sabotage units also ambushed a number of Ukrainian units like this BTR-4E. The vehicle first hit a mine and then was finished off by an RPG. The real problem was that the Russians effectively pinned down the Ukrainians in Sididove, preventing them from intervening elsewhere along the front. This allowed the Russian command to pour all available reserves towards Ukrainsk and encircle the town. That's why any war analyst saying the words meet wave attacks is literally lying to your face. As Russian artillery batteries bombarded the enemy strong points, Assault squads engaged Ukrainian bastions everywhere on the northern outskirts, while others already started mopping up the buildings inside the town. It's not a surprise that three days later, most of Ukrainsk was already in Russian hands. The Battle of Ukrainsk really reminded me of the ones from the Russian Civil War. Due to the flat landscape, cavalry units would overwhelm the defenders and just sweep away rural towns in the blink of an eye. That's when the boys from the 114th Brigade of the DPR raised their banner on top of the mine of Ukrainsk. At the same time, Russian armored columns rushed towards Jelani Perche. Here we can even see a glimpse of one of these assaults. 11 vehicles pushing along this road, supported by another 5 further up. A total of 16 armored vehicles deploying at once. This goes to show the complete lack of minefields in that sector. Anyway, the Russians advanced so fast that the Ukrainians don't even have time to create new minefields and fortifications. In the second part of the footage, we see a Ukrainian drone dropping a grenade inside a friendly trench that was lost to Russian stormtroopers. Now, if we take a quick look at this trench, we clearly see that it was still in construction by the time of the battle. The wooden beams generally are the basis for further construction efforts. The next step is for the beams to be covered by wooden plates, sandbags and dirt to camouflage the entire structure from above. Additionally, a number of firing positions have to be built all along the trenches. But as you can see, 
Nothing of that could be done by the time the Russians reached those positions. By the 20th of September, Russian forces advanced 3,000 meters and captured 3 square kilometers north of Ukrainsk. We can't believe one grouping progressed along this tree line while another pushed along this one. From that point, the tip of the spear was less than 1,500 meters away from the railway line. While this battle was unfolding, further south, DPR regiments pushed out of Krasnorivka along the Lozova River. Not only were they threatening the Nivelsky pocket, but also all these Ukrainian troops around Hewarivka. In this footage, we have a glimpse of how the Russians proceeded. We see an armored column of seven vehicles, with an additional four already having been knocked out at the rear. This advancing column got hit by an intense artillery barrage as well as by numerous drones from the Ukrainian 21st Special Purpose Battalion of the Presidential Guard. These armored assaults are high risk, high reward. For sure, you can get spotted quickly. But if you go through, you can advance 3 to 4 kilometers at once. As reference, that last artillery barrage took place right here on the map, so we can assume this is where the Russian column got halted. Although the Ukrainians gave a bloody nose to the Russians in that sector, we can believe that other Russian columns managed to disembark their infantry component and come back without a problem. I don't know how many or on what days, but take a look at this footage. We see another column of 8 tanks and infantry fighting vehicles of the 5th Tank Brigade Uplot of the DPR. They're the ones that led the charge against Krasnorivka. In this scenario, they pushed across an open field at all speed until they reached this railway line. On the map, this means their last move was this one right in front of the village of Hostre, which the artillery also shelled right before the assault. Once again, this goes to show the inter-arm coordination of Russian armed forces. Then we see the first armored vehicle wreck hell inside the settlement, where they land their infantry squads before heading back to base. All this succession of armored assaults forced the Ukraine command to order a full withdrawal. It's no surprise that the next day, the entire Ukraine front there just collapsed, as they had to abandon almost 30 square kilometers of ground, including half the village of Hostere. All of a sudden, the Ukrainian command now had three crises to manage. Pokrovsk, Selidove and now protect the Hirnik Kurahivka stronghold that faced an enemy pincer maneuver from both the south and the north. Just like the Germans in the steppe of Ukraine during the period of 1943-1944, they're going from one fighting retreat to another. By the 25th of September, pro-Ukrainian deep state UA map conceded the loss of Ukrainsk. Four elements of the Russian army then took position around the Sterikon. That is the last step before reaching the railway line. Remember that just like Russian infantry platoons did during the summer, they can push a lot of troops under the cover of the forested embankments of the railway line. In this case, if they go northwards, they can slide it in right in the rear of Selidove, like that and like that right towards Vishneve. The problem for Ukraine was that Russian sabotage units were now sprawling across the countryside. Spearheads already shoved their tip in between the settlements of Tsukorine and Hirnik. As for Selidove, the situation remained stable. But the settlement was now in a semi-encirclement, and severe fighting erupted all across Marinivka. The entire hamlet was now in a grey zone. If the Ukrainians lost control of this stronghold, the Russians could then sweep through the northern part of Selidove and complete the encirclement. The Ukrainians tried some sort of relief mission with a tank along the E-50 highway, but it was quickly ambushed and targeted by six VT-40 drones. So that was the situation on the central part of the front. But let's move our attention to the northern sector close to Pokrovsk. That was the situation on the 18th of September, and that was the situation one week later on the 25th. As you can see, Russian forces cleared the enemy positions in the sector of Khrodivka and Novokhrodivka. But progression was difficult. Literally every house had to be bombarded, one after the other. Russian riflemen often had no other choice but to advance from one ruin to another. Here we can see a Russian fire team clearing this set of houses. The small number of riflemen deployed makes them harder to be detected by enemy drones. The fighting was concentrated around the settlements of Mikolaivka and Krasny Yar. Now there was this video geolocated around that sector. The description of the video stated that this Ukrainian armored vehicle was destroyed by an RPG strike. I was unsure because this position was relatively far from the contact line. Actually, I'll just show you. As you can see, this happened north of the village of Mikolaivka. 
If we take a closer look at the footage, we can see an impressive set of trenches and dugouts. Using satellite imagery, indeed, north of Mykolaivka, there is a trench bastion which must have been used by the Ukrainian command as forward operating base to counterattack Russian spearheads. What I think happened is the following. Russian assault squads pushed out of this forest, along this tree line, and then cleared this entire bastion going from one trench to another in small teams of three men. At some point, a Ukrainian vehicle arrived and was ambushed at about 300 meters by an RPG. After this flanking maneuver by the Russian army, by the 26th of September, Mykolaivka and Krasny Yar had fallen. For now, I could identify the location of four Russian units. We have the 35th and 74th Mortal Rifle Brigades in the north, the 114th Brigade of the DPR operating near Ukrainsk, and the 5th Brigade of the DPR in the south near Krasnorivka. While in the north, Russian troops were making small incremental gains, more and more Russian troops converged towards the railway line in the Selidove Ukrainsk sector. In this footage, you can see two Russian BMPs pull back after landing their infantry component right in the forested embankment of the railway line. Similar story in the sector of Hirnik, where forward elements managed to raise the white-blue-red flag at the entrance of the town. That's where we have to stop and talk about the drama surrounding the Battle of Hirnik. Military Land posted this article called Abandoned on the Front Line, inside the 210th Battalion Struggle. This is what they wrote. On September 26, 2024, under orders, the 210th Battalion moved into defensive positions in Hirnik, under the command structure of the 59th Motorized Brigade. Eventually, the 210th Territorial Defense Battalion was attached to the 110th Mechanized Brigade. And that's when shit hit the fan. They were ordered to hold some stupid positions with no support whatsoever. The situation deteriorated further when the battalion's left flank collapsed due to a withdrawal by the neighboring 154th Battalion, resulting in a partial encirclement of the 210th Battalion's positions. Yes, sure, the withdrawal of the battalion, yeah. Now facing encirclement, the commander of the 210th Battalion, managed to lead all the units and fight out of the cauldron, but at a great cost. They reported a total of 11k and 70 wounded, for a total of 81 casualties. Not because the commander retreated without orders, because he didn't want his men to be annihilated. Everyone in the battalion was marked as deserters, and the command of the 110th Mechanized Brigade urged the 210th Battalion to regain their positions immediately. Since they had no access to armored vehicles or heavy weapons, the territorial defense guys refused to comply. Witnesses claimed that physical force was used to coerce soldiers into buses, with some even reporting live rounds fired to intimidate those who resisted. What a tragedy, what a nightmare. And this is certainly not the first time this is happening. In early October, the 186th Territorial Defense Battalion was only at 25% strength, but was still ordered to counterattack a Russian armored formation near Vogledar. The commander of the battalion, 33-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Ihor Hrib, refused to carry out these insane orders. Shortly after, he was found unalive in his headquarters after a visit by his superiors. Now if we go back to the events at the front, a lot of pressure was put on the village of Marinivka. Here we see a Russian BMP push at full speed across this field, right under enemy fire. We even see one of the rounds right here as the BMP drives over the highway, before the entire crew of the BMP yelled Privyet to this entire trench bastion, where they then disembarked their entire infantry component somewhere inside the tree line. And then the Russian BMP drove the same way back right under the nose of the enemy. <laughs> Now, I understand that this footage is anecdotal, but actually, if we delve deeper and look at it from a tactical perspective, we can actually understand what happened in Marinivka. The Russian BMP left somewhere from Mikhailivka and rushed like this towards the highway. That's where we saw all the Ukrainian trenches. The BMP dropped the troops here, most likely to cut off the retreat for all these Ukrainian soldiers in Marinivka. And lastly, notice the amount of artillery craters. The bombardment must have been pretty brutal in this sector. Surprise, surprise, by the 27th of September, the Ukrainians are gone from Marinivka, and the Russians are tightening their area of control around Selidove. Some sort of Russian death by snoo-snoo. 
That's when out of nowhere, a Russian unit managed to advance 2000 meters. Although the BMP was destroyed, the soldiers inside managed to evacuate and take refuge inside the forest, where they'll use their titanium shovels to dig in and wait for reinforcements. Then it was a BMP 1AM that rushed in the same direction to disembark about 8 riflemen before being knocked out as well. For sure the Russians are losing a number of armored vehicles by doing so, but they know that their engineers are gonna recover all these armored vehicles eventually, repair them and send them back to the front. Also, as usual, this is the only footage we got, but in reality we can believe that many more Russian infantry squads deployed in these woods. Now though the Ukrainians think the Russians don't take care of their wounded and leave them for dead, this could not be further from the truth. Quads are used to drive the wounded from the contact line back to the rear, from where Russian truck drivers go back and forth between the hospital to evacuate all these military personnel. What I found interesting was the description in the video. It was titled, Takov puts, this is the way. This is the way. By September 30, while the Russians were making gains south of Sedidove, an increasing number of Russian units now poured into the northern sectors of the town. For example, in this footage, we see three Russian armored vehicles that were stopped near this gas station. So you can see that the Russian method is pretty much stop and go. They try to push as far as possible, and if they succeed, they're gonna dig in right there. And with the little reserves and mechanized units available to the Ukrainians, it will be almost impossible to dislodge the Russians from these positions. So now we can really start speaking about the encirclement of Selidove. For Ukraine, the only way to save the town would be with a strong armored counterattack to regain Ukrainsk. But I guess for this, you need a Valta model type of general. October 2024. By the 1st of October, the Russians had captured this mining complex and finally got their first foothold inside the farm village of Tsukorine. The Ukrainian command hopelessly tried to stem the flow of Russian units pouring into the railway line sector. At that point, the front was moving so fast that some Russian storm detachments advanced with any wheeled vehicle they could get their hands on, like these buggies and pickup trucks. By the 3rd of October, the southern part of Tsukorine was under enemy control, and the Russian assault detachments were mopping up the rest of the city. 48 hours later, the Russian army secured its first section of the railway line, and the Ukrainians were carrying out fighting withdrawals in Tsukorine as they knew it was a battle they could simply not win. The tank battalion of the 59th Motorized Brigade ordered two tanks forward for a quick fire mission on the southern part of the village. As one fired from a distance, a second one tore the Russians a new one at point blank. This was Ukraine's last ditch attempt to save the village. But by October 6, Tukurine had fallen. From an operational perspective, the Russian command was driving all its brigades and regiments in a wedge formation in between Selidove and the Hirnik Kurahivka fortress, thus forcing the Ukrainian command to abandon one of these strongholds. The choice was easy. Pokrovsk was the primary objective to defend, so it was those troops in and around Kurahivka that had to be pulled back. However, everything went so fast. By the 7th of October already, it's Jelani Perche that was swarmed by Russian units, which quickly raised their banner over the ruins of the village. 48 hours later, Russian forces controlled a 4km portion of the railway line. Now fast forward a couple days to the 15th of October. In the north, the Russians were pushing step by step towards Mirnohrad. Although the progression was difficult, it pinned down a good number of Ukrainian reserves. While the situation in the south worsened every passing hour. Then we also have to monitor what was happening around Selidove. There the eastern part of the city is covered in orchards and trees, which provided much needed cover for Russian infiltration teams. Some of them set foot inside this set of buildings and turned it into a forward operating base. That's when they were obliterated by Ukrainian BTR-4E during a fire mission at night. If things could not be more critical, the coal miners of the DPR and their armored columns from the Moria achieved a 5km breakthrough all the way to Ostrivske, a hamlet sitting on the banks of the Vovcha River just below Vovchenka. Although an attack northwards would be difficult due to the river they had to cross, plus the overlooking heights, Ostrivske could be turned into an important stepping stone towards Kurachove, one of the largest towns in the region. As you can see on the map, by the 18th of October, firefights erupted all around the Hirnik-Kurachivka sector. 
In other words, this entire Ukraine grouping of about 3,000 men was days away of being completely encircled, especially after this 1,500 meter push south of Tukurine. 24 hours later, the pocket collapsed as the Ukrainian command ordered another 3 kilometer withdrawal. Sorry, sorry, I mean retrograde maneuver. At this point, there were essentially no more Ukrainian units left on the east bank of the Vovcha River, apart perhaps for some rear guard formations. The situation was really difficult because the first Russian troops had already gained a foothold inside Hirnik, and by the 20th of October, the Russian army expanded its breachhead inside the town. To be exact, they controlled one square kilometer of residential buildings. Some people might seem it's not a lot, but just think of the amount of soldiers they can hide in all these buildings. The problem for the Ukraine command was what next? Counterattacking in Hirnik and pushing the Russians out of the town would only delay the inevitable. Even a withdrawal would be complicated if the Ukrainians pulled back their forces behind this railway line and used this position to make a stand while it was already being flanked west of Tsukurine. Even worse, the Ukrainian battalion holding that sector was facing a complete rout as a number of infantry squads just abandoned their combat positions as they were being harassed by enemy drones. We are winning! And notice the complete lack of electronic warfare assets to protect the retreat of these poor Ukrainian soldiers. It's almost criminal! Shortly after, stormtroopers of the 114th Brigade of the DPR celebrated the capture of the remainder of Tsukurine. Then it was Maximilianivka's turn to fall. The road to Kurahove was now officially open. So with this new information, let's redo the Russian order of battle. 102nd Motorized Rifle Regiment pushing along this axis towards Kurahove. 5th Brigade Oplot in support pushing towards both Kurahove and Kurahivka. 114th Brigade Vostok near Tukurine. And the 35th and 74th Motor Rifle Brigades pushing in the direction of Mirnohrad. Oh yeah, talking about the sector, some detachments of Ukrainian paratroopers launched a counterattack in an attempt to reclaim the village of Krasnyar, but let's just say it didn't end well. Look at the amount of artillery craters. You can imagine the amount of artillery shells that fell in that sector. And there in the middle, four destroyed Ukrainian armored vehicles, trapped by the construction of their own anti-tank ditch. Additionally, in this drone footage, we can clearly see that one of these vehicles was an M282 Bradley. These Ukrainian paratroopers were stopped by the Chorni Gusari, the Black Hussars of the 15 separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade. What's interesting about the Black Hussars is that their telegram feed is full of orthodox related posts and historical references to their regiment. Contrary to other units, there's barely anything Soviet. This goes to show the wide range of political ideology within the ranks of the Russian army. Anyway, all this to say that there are actually three Russian brigades pushing along a three kilometer front in the Mirnohrad direction. Surprise, surprise, by the 22nd of October, the Russians advanced 1,200 meters in Seridove and secured this dacha area with all the trees I mentioned before. And the next day, half of Seridove was under Russian control. Moments later, Russian units were seen raising their flags at the city center. What was struck me was that the town is completely intact. A town that could fit 20,000 inhabitants handed intact to the enemy. My friends, it's not looking good. I mean, it's clear the Ukraine command simply decided to abandon Selidove. They probably sent a new wave of elite reinforcements in order to cover the retreat of all the troops. Just like we can see in this footage with this Ukrainian BTR-4E that is blasting at all the buildings in that street just in order to gain some time, in order to allow all friendly units out of the town. Meanwhile, the cavalry charge of the horde continued with this 3km push south of Selidove. They were on their way to cut off this massive withdrawal of the Ukrainian army. At the same time, the 114th Brigade of the DPR, Vostok, expanded out of Tsukurine and started clearing the village of Ismailivka. The Ukrainians stood no chance. Here you can see some of the defenders running away from the village. That's the smell of victory. Now, 
I mean, now it was getting really critical for the Ukrainian army. There was only one main supply route left out of this Hirnik Kurahivka cauldron. It will take a very skilled commander and experienced troops to contain the Russians while all the units safely retreat. Let's go back to Selidove. By the 25th of October, Russian touchdown in Vishneve. And by that point, all of Selidove was in the gray zone. To add insult to injury, operators of the 71st separate Spetsnaz Brigade raised their banner over the Korochenko mine overlooking Selidove. You know the battle is serious when the Russians bring in the Spetsnaz. Bliat, hold on. Is that the Batman flag? And I'm not even done. 26th of October, fall of Zoriane and capture of Alexandropil by the 110th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade, with all of Hirnik in the grey zone. So, as part of my order of battle game, we have two additional units. So here we add the Spetsnaz Battalion and the 110th Brigade of the DPR. 24 hours later, complete disaster. Hirnik, gone. There the 21st Special Purpose Battalion of the Presidential Guard covered the retreat. As for all the other Ukrainian troops there in the cauldron, GG were played, Tavarish, time to get out. The Ukrainian command was witnessing a next level crisis management because the Russians now captured three quarters of Seridove and their infantry squads tailed the withdrawing enemy troops. The Russians also finally swept through the settlement of Vishneve. However, by that point, it wasn't as strategic anymore. Seridove was a done deal. By the 29th of October, all Ukrainian units had left the town opening for Russian army soldiers to celebrate their victory. In this video titled Selidovo Nashe, we see Russian soldiers driving around the town they fought so hard for. Fun historical fact, during the Dnieper campaign, the Soviet army liberated Selidovo on the 8th of September 1943. Now on top of Novohrodivka, the Russian army has another large urban area that can be used as logistics center, just within 10 kilometers of Pokrovsk. Like a domino effect, 24 hours after the fall of Selidove, it was Kurachivka's turn to fall. Can you guess which brigade claimed this ultimate prize? These damn Donbass coal miners of the 114th Vostok Brigade of the DPR. Meanwhile, not much happened in the Mirnohrad sector. We have the fighters of the Mad Dogs Brigade that launched an attack in this direction. But I wanted to show you this footage. Look at how the squad of Russian riflemen is visible. And all of a sudden, they managed to scatter and disappear into the woods. Between the 1st and the 8th of November, the Russian army advanced 3 kilometers along this entire portion of the front. We can see that a lot of fighting is taking place in the sector west of Vishneve, possibly indicating that the Russians intend to push towards Chevchenko in two axes in order to get as close as possible to Pokrovsk. Now, 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 I can't just stop the video here. I also have to tell you how the Horde launched a massive offensive along the yuzhno dombatskaya napravlenye the South Donetsk direction, the Battle of Ugledar. In one of my last videos, we left off on the 17th of September, as the fortress city of Ugledar was getting encircled. Remember what I said. If the Russian command has enough reserves available, we could see them storm Bohoryavlenka at the same time, in order to prevent the Ukrainians from solidifying their fortifications. And if they manage to storm the village at once, they could continue towards Trudove. This maneuver could be combined with the mechanized assault out of Kostyantinivka. On the western side of the battlefield, it's just a matter of time before Zolota and Niva falls into Russian hands. The question is, what will they do after that? One option would be to push towards Nova Ukrainka and form a new cauldron for the Ukrainian troops that will escape out of Ohledar. I also remember showing you this footage of a Russian armored vehicle disembarking troops in the mine complex number one. Well, now we have footage from the Ukrainian side. Here we see a lone Ukrainian soldier firing from one of the towers overlooking the mine just east of Ogledar, as his position gets warmed by enemy troops. A couple days later, the Financial Times reported the following about the Ukrainian 72nd Mechanized Brigade holding the citadel. We've had zero rotations since the full-scale invasion. We need a break. One reason the 72nd Brigade could hold on for so long in the Vogledar sector is that unusually it has seven battalions instead of the standard four. So almost double the strength of a regular Ukrainian brigade. By September 30, the first Russian assault detachments got their foothold inside Vogledar, mopping up one high-rise building after another, all the while being covered by a very dense artillery barrage. 
that was suppressing any safe withdrawal for the Ukrainians. The last defenders of Ugledar were heavily armed. As you can see in this video, they were equipped with all types of weapons. We see them firing their last rounds in their machine guns, grenade launchers, and firing one RPG after another. By October 1st, Vugledar had fallen. The once mighty Ukrainian fortress was now draped in white, blue, red flags and Soviet themed banners. The next day, Ukrainian news agency Slizvo interviewed a member of the staff of one of the battalions of this 72nd Mechanized Brigade. And what he revealed was absolutely shocking. After two years of fighting without rotations and arrest, we turned into an ineffective unit. The brigade was wiped out. Out of 350 men, he says only 30 were left standing by the fall of Vugledar. 30! Can you imagine that? A 92% casualty rate. I repeat, 30 men in a battalion. And out of those 30, only 12 were actual infantrymen. The 18 others were drafted from various support units, such as cooks, mechanics, and truck drivers. Yes, yes, just like the US Army did so often during World War II. But at least the Americans had unlimited replacements, which the Ukrainians don't. And that's not even the worst part of this entire story. The Ukrainian command then tasked this 30-man battalion to hold a two-kilometer front. Madness. Madness and stupidity. The officer also stated that whenever they actually got reinforcements, those were 50-year-old grandfathers with zero military training. He also said something interesting regarding topography. What is the commanding heights these days if the enemy's reconnaissance drones are hanging over you 24-7? The Russian grouping around Ugledar then took a three-week pause. They simply shaped the battlefield for the next operation. By the 14th of October, the Russians had captured Zolota and Niva. But I doubt the Ukrainians offered more than a rearguard battle for that village. In this video, we can see a column of six vehicles of a storm detachment of the 40th Marine Brigade pushing right into the settlement all the while suffering barely any losses. They also brought in a fresh formation to spearhead the offensive, namely the 40th Airborne Assault Brigade. October 25th, Triple Penetration. Number one, attack against Katerinivka. It's the second battalion of the 39th Mortal Rifle Brigade that led the charge. Number two, push towards Bohoyavlenka as part of this first belt of villages behind Vukledar. At last, a six kilometer advance towards Shakhtarske. In this footage, we can clearly see how Russian armored vehicles literally charged like cavalry, facing barely any enemy resistance. Honestly, it's as if Russian forces simply teleported in Chakhtarsky. When was the last time we saw a 6km breakthrough? The next day, Russian airborne assault detachments were now swarming inside the farm village. Notice the lack of shell craters and ruins, clearly indicating, once again, that little to no resistance was encountered. Not only that, but now the Russians upgraded this to a foursome because of another 3km push towards Novokrenka. By that point, half of Bohoyavlenka was under Russian control. We could see swarms of small Russian fire teams progressing in open terrain, again without facing much enemy fire. By the 29th of October, the Russians achieved yet another 3km push north of Shakhtarske. Meanwhile, men of the 57th Brigade captured the village of Bohoyavlenka and some spearheads were already pushing northwards towards Trudove. The village of Ukrenka also fell shortly after. This left many Ukrainian pockets to be cut off and encircled. So by the 31st, the Ukrainian command ordered all of them back. By the end of the month, the Russian army was tailing the Ukrainians like no tomorrow. Even worse, the Ukrainian command had not fortified a single village behind Vugledar. That's how men of the storm detachment of the 5th Brigade secured Yasna Polyana. Not only did the Russians gain a lot of terrain, but they have effectively secured a 10 km radius around Vugledar. What next for the South Donetsk front? By the 8th of November, the Russians advanced some more. At this rate, within two weeks, they could be sitting on the banks of the Vovcha River and thus threatened this entire Ukrainian grouping with encirclement, meaning it's just a matter of time before the AFU evacuates from this forming pocket. In the end, although the Ukrainian army managed to salvage Pokrovsk, the road linking Pokrovsk to Kostyantinivka, the crown jewels, and they even managed to hold in Taryetsk, essentially the entire northern part of Donetsk Oblast, the trade-off was giving up the entire southern part of Donetsk Oblast. 
and the situation could get much worse very quickly. If we zoom out, there's this massive bulge covering a 63 kilometer front that is about to get crushed both from the north and the south with no real topographic barrier or urban nodes that can stop the horde. At this rate, it's just a matter of time before Russian army units link up at the banks of the Vovcha River. Even if the Ukrainians decided to make a stand there, it's impossible because the Russians are already popping up in their back. I mean, look at that, the Russians are already in Novodmitrivka and their forward elements are heading for Santsivka. It's a disaster. This also means the fortress of Kurahove cannot be defended. Unless the Ukrainian garrison decides to make a stand and fight until the end like in Mariupol, it will simply fall in Russian hands. Overall, in the South Donetsk direction, Ukraine's only real strong points are Pokrovsk and Velika Novosilka, but there's a 50 km gap in between those two cities, separated only by potato fields, an empty area in which we could see the Russian army pour all its reserves. By mid-December, the front line could very well look like that in the South Donetsk direction. And then, the big question will be, what's next? Are they gonna drive north for Pokrovsk? Or are they gonna charge westwards towards Zaporozhye? That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The link is in the description below.